Chapter 23, Part 4 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The restoration of the Jewish temple was secretly connected with the ruin of the Christian church. Julian still continued to maintain the freedom of religious worship without distinguishing whether this universal toleration proceeded from his justice or his clemency. He affected to pity the unhappy Christians, who were mistaken in the most important object of their lives. But his pity was degraded by contempt, his contempt was embittered by hatred, and the sentiments of Julian were expressed in a style of sarcastic wit, which inflicts a deep and deadly wound whenever it issues from the mouth of a sovereign. As he was sensible that the Christians gloried in the name of their Redeemer, he countenanced, and perhaps enjoyed, the use of the less honorable appellation of Galileans. He declared that, by the folly of the Galileans, whom he describes as a sect of fanatics, contemptible to men, and odious to the gods, the empire had been reduced to the brink of destruction, and he insinuates in a public edict that a frantic patient might sometimes be cured by salutary violence. An ungenerous distinction was admitted into the mind and counsels of Julian, that, according to the difference of their religious sentiments, one part of his subjects deserved his favor and friendship, while the other part was entitled only to the common benefits that his justice could not refuse to an obedient people. According to a principle pregnant with mischief and oppression, the emperor transferred to the pontiffs of his own religion the management of the liberal allowances from the public revenue which had been granted to the church by the piety of Constantine and his sons. The proud system of clerical honors and immunities, which had been constructed with so much art and labor, was leveled to the ground. The hopes of testamentary donations were intercepted by the rigors of the laws, and the priests of the Christian sect were confounded with the last and most ignominious class of the people. Such of these regulations as appeared necessary to check the ambition and avarice of the ecclesiastics were soon afterwards imitated by the wisdom of an orthodox prince. The peculiar distinctions which policy has bestowed or superstition has lavished on the sacerdotal order must be confined to those priests who profess the religion of the state. But the will of the legislator was not exempt from prejudice and passion, and it was the object of the insidious policy of Julian to deprive the Christians of all the temporal honors and advantages which rendered them respectable in the eyes of the world. A just and severe censure has been inflicted on the law which prohibited the Christians from teaching the arts of grammar and rhetoric. The motives alleged by the emperor to justify this partial and oppressive measure might command, during his lifetime, the silence of slaves and the applause of flatterers. Julian abuses the ambiguous meaning of a word which might be indifferently applied to the language and the religion of the Greeks. He contemptuously observes that the men who exalt the merit of implicit faith are unfit to claim or to enjoy the advantages of science. He vainly contends that if they refuse to adore the gods of Homer and Demosthenes, they ought to content themselves with expounding Luke and Matthew in the churches of the Galileans. In all the cities of the Roman world, the education of the youth was entrusted to masters of grammar and rhetoric, who were elected by the magistrates, maintained at the public expense, and distinguished by many lucrative and honorable privileges. The edict of Julian appears to have included the physicians and professors of all the liberal arts, and the emperor, who reserved to himself the approbation of the candidates, was authorized by the laws to corrupt or to punish the religious constancy of the most learned of the Christians. As soon as the resignation of the more obstinate teachers had established the unrivaled dominion of the pagan sophists, Julian invited the rising generation to resort with freedom to the public schools in a just confidence that their tender minds would receive the impressions of literature and idolatry. If the greatest part of the Christian youth should be deterred by their own scruples or by those of their parents from accepting this dangerous mode of instruction, they must at the same time relinquish the benefits of a liberal education. Julian had reason to expect that, in the space of a few years, the church would relapse into its primeval simplicity, and that the theologians, who possessed an adequate share of the learning and eloquence of the age, would be succeeded by a generation of blind and ignorant fanatics, 
incapable of defending the truth of their own principles, or of exposing the various follies of polytheism. It was undoubtedly the wish and design of Julian to deprive the Christians of the advantages of wealth, of knowledge, and of power. But the injustice of excluding them from all offices of trust and profit seems to have been the result of his general policy, rather than the immediate consequence of any positive law. Superior merit might deserve and obtain some extraordinary exceptions, but the greater part of the Christian officers were gradually removed from their employments in the state, the army, and the provinces. The hopes of future candidates were extinguished by the declared partiality of a prince, who maliciously reminded them that it was unlawful for a Christian to use the sword, either of justice or of war, and who studiously guarded the camp and tribunals with the ensigns of idolatry. The powers of government were entrusted to the pagans, who professed an ardent zeal for the religion of their ancestors, and as the choice of the emperor was often directed by the rules of divination, the favorites whom he preferred as the most agreeable to the gods did not always obtain the approbation of mankind. Under the administration of their enemies, the Christians had much to suffer and much to apprehend. The temper of Julian was adverse to cruelty, and the care of his reputation, which was exposed to the eyes of the universe, restrained the philosophic monarch from violating the laws of justice and toleration, which he himself had so recently established. But the provincial ministers of his authority were placed in a less conspicuous station. In the exercise of arbitrary power, they consulted the wishes rather than the commands of their sovereign, and ventured to exercise a secret and vexatious tyranny against the sectaries on whom they were not permitted to confer the honors of martyrdom. The emperor, who dissembled as long as possible his knowledge of the injustice which was exercised in his name, expressed his real sense of the conduct of his officers by gentle reproofs and substantial rewards. The most effectual instrument of oppression with which they were armed was the law that obliged the Christians to make full and ample satisfaction for the temples which they had destroyed under the preceding reign. The zeal of the triumphant church had not always expected the sanction of the public authority, and the bishops, who were secure of impunity, had often marched at the head of their congregations to attack and demolish the fortresses of the prince of darkness. The consecrated lands, which had increased the patrimony of the sovereign, or of the clergy, were clearly defined and easily restored. But on these lands, and on the ruins of pagan superstition, the Christians had frequently erected their own religious edifices, and as it was necessary to remove the church before the temple could be rebuilt, the justice and piety of the emperor were applauded by one party, while the other deplored and execrated his sacrilegious violence. After the ground was cleared, the restitution of those stately structures which had been leveled with the dust, and of the precious ornaments which had been converted to Christian uses, swelled into a very large account of damages and debt. The authors of the injury had neither the ability nor the inclination to discharge this accumulated demand, and the impartial wisdom of a legislator would have been displayed in balancing the adverse claims and complaints by an equitable and temperate arbitration. But the whole empire, and particularly the East, was thrown into confusion by the rash edicts of Julian, and the pagan magistrates, inflamed by zeal and revenge, abused the rigorous privilege of the Roman law, which substitutes, in the place of his inadequate property, the person of the insolvent debtor. Under the preceding reign, Mark, bishop of Arethusa, had labored in the conversion of his people, with arms more effectual than those of persuasion. The magistrates required the full value of a temple which had been destroyed by his intolerant zeal, but as they were satisfied of his poverty, they desired only to bend his inflexible spirit to the promise of the slightest compensation. They apprehended the aged prelate. They inhumanly scourged him. They tore his beard, his naked body, anointed with honey, was suspended in a net between heaven and earth, and exposed to the stings of insects and the rays of a Syrian sun. From this lofty station, Mark still persisted to glory in his crime, and to insult the impotent range of his persecutors. He was at length rescued from their hands, and dismissed to enjoy the honor of his divine triumph. The Arians celebrated the virtue of their pious confessor. The Catholics ambitiously claimed his alliance, and the pagans, who might be susceptible of shame or remorse, were deterred from the repetition of such unavailing cruelty. Julian spared his life, 
but if the bishop of Arethusa had saved the infancy of Julian, posterity will condemn the ingratitude instead of praising the clemency of the emperor. At the distance of five miles from Antioch, the Macedonian kings of Syria had consecrated to Apollo one of the most elegant places of devotion in the pagan world. A magnificent temple rose in honor of the god of light, and his colossal figure almost filled the capacious sanctuary, which was enriched with gold and gems, and endured by the skill of the Grecian artists. The deity was represented in a bending attitude, with a golden cup in his hand, pouring out a libation on the earth, and if he supplicated the venerable mother to give to his arms the cold and beauteous Daphne, for the spot was ennobled by fiction, and the fancy of the Syrian poets had transported the amorous tales from the banks of the Peneus to those of the Orontes. The ancient rites of Greece were imitated by the royal colony of Antioch. A stream of prophecy, which rivaled the truth and reputation of the Delphic oracle, flowed from the Castilian fountain of Daphne. In the adjacent fields a stadium was built by a special privilege, which had been purchased from Ellis. The Olympic Games were celebrated at the expense of the city, and a revenue of 30,000 pounds sterling was annually applied to the public pleasures. The perpetual resort of pilgrims and spectators insensibly formed, in the neighborhood of the temple, the stately and populous village of Daphne, which emulated the splendor without acquiring the title of a provincial city. The temple and the village were deeply bosomed in a thick grove of laurels and cypresses, which reached as far as the circumference of ten miles, and formed in the most sultry summers a cool and impenetrable shade. A thousand streams of the purest water, issuing from every hill, preserved the verdure of the earth and the temperature of the air. The senses were gratified with harmonious sounds and aromatic odors, and the peaceful grove was consecrated to health and joy, to luxury and love. The vigorous youth pursued, like Apollo, the object of his desires, and the blushing maid was warned by the fate of Daphne to shun the folly of unseasonable coyness. The soldier and the philosopher wisely avoided the temptation of this sensual paradise, where pleasure, assuming the character of religion, imperceptibly dissolved the firmness of manly virtue. But the groves of Daphne continued for many ages to enjoy the veneration of natives and strangers. The privileges of the holy ground were enlarged by the munificence of seceding emperors, and every generation added new ornaments to the splendor of the temple. When Julian, on the day of the annual festival, hastened to the door of the Apollo of Daphne, his devotion was raised to the highest pitch of eagerness and impatience. His lively imagination anticipated the grateful pomp of victims, of libations, of incense, a long procession of youths and virgins clothed in white robes, the symbol of their innocence, and the tumultual concourse of an innumerable people. But the zeal of Antioch was diverted since the reign of Christianity into a different channel. Instead of hecticombs of fat oxen sacrificed by the tribes of a wealthy city to their tutelar deity, the emperor complains that he found only a single goose provided at the expense of a priest, the pale and solitary inhabitant of this decayed temple. The altar was deserted, the oracle had been reduced to silence, and the holy ground was profaned by the introduction of Christian and funeral rites. After Babylas, bishop of Antioch, who died in prison in the persecution of Decius, had rested near a century in his grave, his body, by the order of the Caesar Gallus, was transported into the midst of the grove of Daphne. A magnificent church was erected over his remains. A portion of the sacred lands was usurped for the maintenance of the clergy, and for the burial of the Christians of Antioch, who were ambitious of lying at the feet of their bishop, and the priests of Apollo retired with their affrighted and indignant votaries. As soon as another revolution seemed to restore the favor of paganism, the church of St. Babylas was demolished, and new buildings were added to the moldering edifice which had been raised by the piety of Syrian kings. But the first and most serious care of Julian was to deliver his oppressed deity from the odious presence of the dead and living Christians, who had so effectually suppressed the voice of fraud and enthusiasm. The scene of infection was purified according to the forms of ancient rituals. The bodies were decently removed, and the ministers of the church were permitted to convey the remains of St. Babylas to their former habitation within the walls of Antioch, 
the modest behavior which might have assuaged the jealousy of a hostile government was neglected on this occasion by the zeal of the Christians. The lofty car that transported the relics of Babylas was followed and accompanied and received by an innumerable multitude, who chanted, with thundering acclamations, the Psalms of David, the most expressive of their contempt for idols and idolaters. The return of the saint was a triumph, and the triumph was an insult on the religion of the emperor, who exerted his pride to dissemble his resentment. During the night which terminated this indiscreet procession, the temple of Daphne was in flames, the statue of Apollo was consumed, and the walls of the edifice were left a naked and awful monument of ruin. The Christians of Antioch asserted with religious confidence that the powerful intercession of St. Babylas had pointed the lightnings of heaven against the devoted roof, but as Julian was reduced to the alternative of believing either a crime or a miracle, he chose without hesitation without evidence, but with some color of probability, to impute the fire of Daphne to the revenge of the Galileans. Their offense, had it been sufficiently proved, might have justified the retaliation, which was immediately executed by the order of Julian, of shutting the doors and confiscating the wealth of the cathedral of Antioch. To discover the criminals who were guilty of the tumult, of the fire, or of secreting the riches of the church, several ecclesiastics were tortured, and a presbyter, by the name of Theodoret, was beheaded by the sentence of the Count of the East. But this hasty act was blamed by the Emperor, who lamented, with real or affected concern, that the imprudent zeal of his ministers might tarnish his reign with the disgrace of persecution. End of chapter 23, part 4《ャプター23、パート5、The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire、Volume 2。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The zeal of the ministers of Julian was instantly checked by the frown of their sovereign. But when the father of his country declares himself the leader of a faction, the license of popular fury cannot easily be restrained, nor consistently punished. Julian, in a public composition, applauds the devotion and loyalty of the holy cities of Syria, whose pious inhabitants had destroyed, at the first signal, the sepulchres of the Galileans, and faintly complains that they had revenged the injuries of the gods with less moderation than he should have recommended. This imperfect and reluctant confession may appear to confirm the ecclesiastical narratives that in the cities of Gaza, Ascalon, Caesarea, Heliopolis, etc., the pagans abused, without prudence or remorse, the moment of their prosperity, that the unhappy objects of their cruelty were released from torture only by death, that, as their mangled bodies were dragged through the streets, they were pierced, such was the universal rage, by the spits of cooks and the distaffs of enraged women, and that the entrails of Christian priests and virgins, after they had been tasted by those bloody fanatics, were mixed with barley and contemptuously thrown to the unclean animals of the city. Such scenes of religious madness exhibit the most contemptible and odious picture of human nature. But the massacre of Alexandria attracts still more attention from the certainty of the fact, the rank of the victims, and the splendor of the capital of Egypt. George, from his parents or his education, surnamed the Cappadocian, was born at Epiphania, in Cilicia, in a fuller's shop. From this obscure and servile origin he raised himself by the talents of a parasite, and the patrons whom he assiduously flattered procured for their worthless dependent a lucrative commission, or contract, to supply the army with bacon. His employment was mean. He rendered it infamous. He accumulated wealth by the basest arts of fraud and corruption, but his malaversions were so notorious that George was compelled to escape from the pursuits of justice. After this disgrace, in which he appears to have saved his fortune at the expense of his honor, he embraced with real or affected zeal the profession of Arianism. From the love or the ostentation of learning, he collected a valuable library of history, rhetoric, philosophy, and theology, and the choice of the prevailing faction promoted George of Cappadocia to the throne of Athanasius. The entrance of the new archbishop was that of a barbarian conqueror, and each moment of his reign was polluted by cruelty and avarice. The Catholics of Alexandria and Egypt were abandoned to a tyrant 
qualified by nature and education to exercise the office of persecution. But he oppressed with an impartial hand the various inhabitants of his extensive diocese. The primate of Egypt assumed the pomp and insolence of his lofty station, but he still betrayed the vices of his base and servile extraction. The merchants of Alexandria were impoverished by the unjust and almost universal monopoly which he acquired of nitre, salt, paper, funerals, etc., and the spiritual father of a great people condescended to practice the vile and pernicious arts of an informer. The Alexandrians could never forget, nor forgive, the tax which he suggested on all the houses of the city, under an obsolete claim that the royal founder had conveyed to his successors, the Ptolemies and the Caesars, the perpetual property of the soil. The pagans, who had been flattered with the hopes of freedom and toleration, excited his devout avarice and the rich temples of Alexandria were either pillaged or insulted by the haughty prelate, who exclaimed in a loud and threatening tone, How long will these sepulchres be permitted to stand? Under the reign of Constantius he was expelled by the fury, or rather by the justice of the people, and it was not without a violent struggle that the civil and military powers of the state could restore his authority and gratify his revenge. The messenger who proclaimed at Alexandria the accession of Julian announced the downfall of the archbishop. George, with two of his obsequious ministers, Count Diodorus and Dracontius, master of the mint, were ignominiously dragged in chains to the public prison. At the end of twenty-four days the prison was forced open by the rage of a superstitious multitude, impatient of the tedious forms of judicial proceedings. The enemy of gods and men expired under their cruel insults, the lifeless bodies of the archbishop and his associates were carried in triumph through the streets on the back of a camel, and the inactivity of the Athanasian party was esteemed a shining example of evangelical patience. The remains of these guilty wretches were thrown into the sea, and the popular leaders of the tumult declared their resolution to disappoint the devotions of the Christians, and to intercept the future honors of these martyrs, who had been punished, like their predecessors, by the enemies of their religion. The fears of the pagans were just, their precautions ineffectual. The meritorious death of the archbishop obliterated the memory of his life. The rival of Athanasius was dear and sacred to the Arians, and the seeming conversion of those sectaries introduced his worship into the bosom of the Catholic Church. The odious stranger, disguising every circumstance of time and place, assumed the rank of a martyr, a saint, and a Christian hero, and the infamous George of Cappadocia has been transformed into the renowned St. George of England, the patron of arms, of chivalry, and of the garter. About the same time that Julian was informed of the tumult of Alexandria, he received intelligence from Edessa that the proud and wealthy faction of the Arians had insulted the weakness of the Valentinians, and committed such disorders as ought not to be suffered with impunity in a well-regulated state. Without expecting the slow forms of justice, the exasperated prince directed his mandate to the magistrates of Edessa, by which he confiscated the whole property of the church. The money was distributed among the soldiers, the lands were added to the domain, and this act of oppression was aggravated by the most ungenerous irony. I show myself, says Julian, the true friend of the Galileans. Their admirable law has promised the kingdom of heaven to the poor and they will advance with more diligence in the paths of virtue and salvation when they are relieved by my assistance from the load of temporal possessions. Take care, pursued the monarch in a more serious tone. Take care how you provoke my patience and humanity. If these disorders continue, I will revenge on the magistrates the crimes of the people, and you will have a reason to dread not only confiscation and exile, but fire and the sword." The tumults of Alexandria were doubtless of a more bloody and dangerous nature. But a Christian bishop had fallen by the hands of the pagans, and the public epistle of Julian affords a very lively proof of the partial spirit of his administration. His reproaches to the citizens of Alexandria are mingled with expressions of esteem and tenderness, and he laments that, on this occasion, they should have departed from the gentle and generous manners which attested their Grecian extraction. He gravely censures the offense which they had committed against the laws of justice and humanity, but he recapitulates with visible complacency the intolerable provocations which they had so long endured from the impious tyranny of George of Cappadocia. Julian admits the principle that a wise and vigorous government should chastise the insolent of the people, 
yet in consideration of their founder, Alexander, and of Serapis, their tutelar deity, he grants a free and gracious pardon to the guilty city, for which he again feels the affection of a brother. After the tumult of Alexandria had subsided, Athanasius, amidst the public acclamations, seated himself on the throne from whence his unworthy competitor had been precipitated, and as the zeal of the archbishop was tempered with discretion, the exercise of his authority tended not to inflame, but to reconcile the minds of the people. His pastoral labors were not confined to the narrow limits of Egypt. The state of the Christian world was present to his active and capacious mind, and the age, the merit, the reputation of Athanasius, enabled him to assume, in a moment of danger, the office of ecclesiastical dictator. Three years were not yet elapsed, since the majority of the bishops of the West had, ignorantly or reluctantly, subscribed to the confession of Rimini. They repented, they believed, but they dreaded the unseasonable rigor of their orthodox brethren, and if their pride was stronger than their faith, they might throw themselves into the hands of the Arians to escape the indignity of a public penance which must degrade them to the condition of obscure laymen. At the same time, the domestic differences concerning the union and the distinction of the divine persons were agitated with some heat among the Catholic doctors, and the progress of this metaphysical controversy seemed to threaten a public and lasting division of the Greek and Latin churches. By the wisdom of a select synod, to which the name and presence of Athanasius gave the authority of a general council, the bishops, who had unwarily deviated into air, were admitted to the communion of the church, on the easy condition of subscribing the Nicene Creed, without any formal acknowledgment of their past fault, or any minute definition of their scholastic opinions. The advice of the primate of Egypt had already prepared the clergy of Gaul and Spain, of Italy and Greece, for the reception of this salutary measure, and notwithstanding the oppression of some ardent spirits, the fear of the common enemy promoted the peace and harmony of the Christians. The skill and diligence of the primate of Egypt had improved the season of tranquility before it was interrupted by the hostile edicts of the emperor. Julian, who despised the Christians, honored Athanasius with his sincere and peculiar hatred. For his sake alone he introduced an arbitrary distinction, repugnant at least to the spirit of his former declarations. He maintained that the Galileans, whom he had recalled from exile, were not restored, by that general indulgence, to the possession of their respective churches. He expressed his astonishment that a criminal, who had been repeatedly condemned by the judgment of the emperors, should dare to insult the majesty of the laws, and insolently usurp the archepiscopal throne of Alexandria, without expecting the orders of his sovereign. As a punishment for the imaginary offense, he again banished Athanasius from the city, and he was pleased to suppose that this act of justice would be highly agreeable to his pious subjects. The pressing solicitations of the people soon convinced him that the majority of the Alexandrians were Christians, and that the greatest part of the Christians were firmly attached to the cause of their oppressed primate. But the knowledge of their sentiments, instead of persuading him to recall his decree, provoked him to extend to all of Egypt the term of the exile of Athanasius. The zeal of the multitude rendered Julian still more inexorable. He was alarmed by the danger of leaving at the head of a tumultuous city a daring and popular leader, and the language of his resentment discovers the opinion which he entertained of the courage and abilities of Athanasius. The execution of the sentence was still delayed by the caution or negligence of Atticius, the prefect of Egypt, who was at length awakened from his lethargy by a severe reprimand. Though you neglect, says Julian, to write me on any other subject, at least it is your duty to inform me of your conduct towards Athanasius, the enemy of the gods. My intentions have been long communicated to you. I swear by the great Serapis that unless, on the calends of December, Athanasius is departed from Alexandria, nay, from Egypt, the officers of your government shall pay a fine of one hundred pounds of gold. You know my temper. I am slow to condemn, but I am still slower to forgive." The epistle was enforced by a short postscript written with the emperor's own hand. The contempt that is shown for all the gods fills me with grief and indignation. There was nothing that I should see, nothing that I should hear, with more pleasure than the expulsion of Athanasius from all Egypt. The abominable wretch, under my reign, the baptism of several Grecian ladies of the highest rank, has been the effect of his persecutions.'
the death of Athanasius was not expressly commanded, but the prefect of Egypt understood that it was safer for him to accede than to neglect the orders of an irritated master. The archbishop prudently retired to the monasteries of the desert, eluded with his usual dexterity the snares of the enemy, and lived to triumph over the ashes of a prince, who, in the words of formidable import, had declared his wish that the whole venom of the Galilean school were contained in the single person of Athanasius. I have endeavored faithfully to represent the artful system by which Julian proposed to obtain the effects without incurring the guilt or reproach of persecution. But if the deadly spirit of fanaticism perverted the heart and the understanding of a virtuous prince, it must at the same time be confessed that the real sufferings of the Christians were inflamed and magnified by human passions and religious enthusiasm. The meekness and resignation which had distinguished the primitive disciples of the gospel was the object of the applause rather than of the imitation of their successors. The Christians who had now possessed above forty years the civil and ecclesiastical governments of the empire had contracted the insolent vices of prosperity and the habit of believing that the saints alone were entitled to reign over the earth. As soon as the enmity of Julian deprived the clergy of the privileges which had been conferred by the favor of Constantine, they complained of the most cruel oppression, and the free toleration of idolaters and heretics was the subject of grief and scandal to the orthodox party. The acts of violence which were no longer countenanced by the magistrates were still committed by the zeal of the people. At Pessinus, the altar of Sibele was overturned almost in the presence of the emperor, and in the city of Caesarea in Cappadocia, the temple of fortune, the sole place of worship which had been left to the pagans, was destroyed by the rage of a popular tumult. On these occasions a prince, who felt for the honor of the gods, was not disposed to interrupt the course of justice and his mind was still more deeply exasperated when he found that the fanatics who had deserved and suffered the punishment of incendiaries were rewarded with the honors of martyrdom. The Christian subjects of Julian were assured of the hostile designs of their sovereign, and to their jealous apprehension every circumstance of his government might afford some grounds of discontent and suspicion. In the ordinary administration of the laws, the Christians who formed so large a part of the people must frequently be condemned, but their indigent brethren, without examining the merits of the cause, presumed their innocence, allowed their claims, and imputed with severity of their judge to the partial malice of religious persecution. These present hardships, intolerable as they might appear, were represented as a single prelude of the impending calamities. The Christians considered Julian as a cruel and crafty tyrant, who suspended the execution of his revenge till he should return victorious from the Persian War. They expected that, as soon as he had triumphed over the foreign enemies of Rome, he should lay aside the irksome mask of dissimulation, that the amphitheaters would stream with the blood of hermits and bishops, that the Christians who still persevered in the profession of the faith would be deprived of the common benefits of nature and society. Every calumny that could wound the reputation of the apostate was credulously embraced by the fears and hatreds of his adversaries, and their industry clamors provoked the temper of a sovereign who it was their duty to respect and their interest to flatter. They still protested that prayers and tears were their only weapons against the impious tyrant, whose head they devoted to the justice of offended heaven. But they insinuated with sullen resolution that their submission was no longer the effect of weakness, and that, in the imperfect state of human virtue, the patience which is founded on principle may be exhausted by persecution. It is impossible to determine how far the zeal of Julian would have prevailed over his good sense and humanity. But, if we seriously reflect on the strength and spirit of the Church, we shall be convinced that, before the Emperor could have extinguished the religion of Christ, he must have involved his country in the horrors of a civil war. End of chapter 23, part 5《Part I of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monsbro, Helsingfors, Finland. Chapter 24 The Retreat and Death of Julian. Part 1. Residence of Julian at Antioch. 
his successful expedition against the Persians, passage of the Tigris, the retreat and death of Julian, election of Jovian, he saves the Roman army by a disgraceful treaty. The philosophical fable which Julian composed under the name of the Caesars is one of the most agreeable and instructive productions of ancient wit. During the freedom and equality of the days of the Saturnalia, Romulus prepared a feast for the deities of Olympus, who had adopted him as a worthy associate, and for the Roman princes who had reigned over his martial people and the vanquished nations of the earth. The immortals were placed in just order on their thrones of state, and the table of the Caesars was spread below the moon in the upper region of the air. The tyrants, who would have disgraced the society of gods and men, were thrown headlong by the inexorable nemesis into the Tartarian abyss. The rest of the Caesars successively advanced to their seats, and as they passed, the vices, the defects, the blemishes of their respective characters were maliciously noticed by old Silenus, a laughing moralist, who disguised the wisdom of a philosopher under the mask of a bacchanal. As soon as the feast was ended, the voice of Mercury proclaimed the will of Jupiter, that a celestial crown should be the reward of superior merit. Julius Caesar, Augustus, Trajan, and Marcus Antoninus were selected as the most illustrious candidates. The effeminate Constantine was not excluded from this honorable competition, and the great Alexander was invited to dispute the prize of glory with the Roman heroes. Each of the candidates was allowed to display the merit of his own exploits, but in the judgment of the gods, the modest silence of Marcus pleaded more powerful than the elaborate orations of his haughty rivals. When the judges of this awful contest proceeded to examine the heart and to scrutinize the springs of action, the superiority of the imperial Stoic appeared still more decisive and conspicuous. Alexander and Caesar, Augustus, Trajan, and Constantine, acknowledged with a blush that fame or power or pleasure had been the important object of their labors. But the gods themselves beheld, with reverence and love, a virtuous mortal, who had practiced on the throne the lessons of philosophy, and who, in a state of human imperfection, had aspired to imitate the moral attributes of the deity. The value of this agreeable composition, the Caesars of Julian, is enhanced by the rank of the author, a prince who delineates with freedom the vices and virtues of his predecessors, subscribes in every line the censure or approbation of his own conduct. In the cool moments of reflection, Julian preferred the useful and benevolent virtues of Antoninus, but his ambitious spirit was inflamed by the glory of Alexander, and he solicited with equal ardor the esteem of the wise and the applause of the multitude. In the season of life, when the powers of the mind and body enjoy the most active vigor, the emperor who was instructed by the experience and animated by the success of the German war, resolved to signalize his reign by some more splendid and memorable achievement. The ambassadors of the East, from the continent of India and the Isle of Ceylon, had respectfully saluted the Roman purple. The nations of the West esteemed and dreaded the personal virtues of Julian, both in peace and war. He despised the trophies of a Gothic victory, and was satisfied that the rapacious barbarians of the Danube would be restrained from any future violation of the faith of treaties by the terror of his name, and the additional fortifications with which he strengthened the Thracian and Illyrian frontiers. The successor of Cyrus and Artaxerxes was the only rival whom he deemed worthy of his arms, and he resolved, by the final conquest of Persia, to chastise the naughty nation which had so long resisted and insulted the majesty of Rome. As soon as the Persian monarch was informed that the throne of Constantius was filled by a prince of a very different character, he condescended to make some artful, or perhaps sincere, overtures towards a negotiation of peace. Was the pride of Sapor was astonished by the firmness of Julian, who sternly declared that he would never consent to hold a peaceful conference among the flames and ruins of the cities of Mesopotamia, and who added, with a smile of contempt, that it was needless to treat by ambassadors, as he himself had determined to visit speedily the court of Persia. The impatience of the emperor urged the diligence of the military preparations. The generals were named, and Julian, marching from Constantinople through the provinces of Asia Minor, arrived at Antioch about eight months after the death of his predecessor. His ardent desire to march into the heart of Persia 
was checked by the indispensable duty of regulating the state of the empire, by his zeal to revive the worship of the gods, and by the advice of his wisest friends, who represented the necessity of allowing the salutary interval of winter quarters to restore the exhausted strength of the legions of Gaul and the discipline and spirit of the eastern troops. Julian was persuaded to fix, till the ensuing spring, his residence at Antioch, among a people maliciously disposed to deride the haste and to censure the delays of their sovereign. If Julian had flattered himself that his personal connection with the capital of the East would be productive of mutual satisfaction to the prince and the people, he made a very false estimate of his own character, and of the manners of Antioch. The warmth of the climate disposed the natives to the most intemperate enjoyment of tranquillity and opulence, and the lively licentiousness of the Greeks was blended with the hereditary softness of the Syrians. Fashion was the only law, pleasure the only pursuit, and the splendor of dress and furniture was the only distinction of the citizens of Antioch. The arts of luxury were honored, the serious and manly virtues were the subject of ridicule, and the contempt for female modesty and reverent age announced the universal corruption of the capital of the East. The love of spectacles was the taste, or rather passion, of the Syrians. The most skillful artists were procured from the adjacent cities, a considerable share of their revenue was devoted to public amusements, and the magnificence of the games of the theatre and circus was considered as the happiness and the glory of Antioch. The rustic manners of a prince, who disdained such glory, and was insensible of such happiness, soon disgusted the delicacy of his subjects, and the effeminate Orientals could neither imitate nor admire the severe simplicity which Julian always maintained, and sometimes affected. The days of festivity, consecrated by ancient custom to the honor of the gods, were the only occasions in which Julian relaxed his philosophic severity, and those festivals were the only days in which the Syrians of Antioch could reject the allurements of pleasure. The majority of the people supported the glory of the Christian name, which had been first invented by their ancestors. They contented themselves with disobeying the moral precepts, but they were scrupulously attached to the speculative doctrines of their religion. The church of Antioch was distracted by heresy and schism, but the Arians and the Athanasians, the followers of Meletius and those of Paulinus, were actuated by the same pious hatred of the common adversary. The strongest prejudice was entertained against the character of an apostate, the enemy and successor of a prince who had engaged the affections of a very numerous sect, and the removal of St. Babylas excited an implacable opposition to the person of Julian. His subjects complained, with superstitious indignation, that famine had pursued the emperor's steps from Constantinople to Antioch, and the discontent of a hungry people was exasperated by the injudicious attempts to relieve their distress. The inclemency of the season had affected the harvest of Syria, and the price of bread in the markets of Antioch had naturally risen in proportion to the scarcity of corn. But the fair and reasonable proportion was soon violated by the rapacious art of monopoly. In this unequal contest, in which the produce of the land is claimed by one party as his exclusive property, is used by another as a lucrative object of trade, and is required by the third for the daily and necessary support of life, all the profits of the intermediate agents are accumulated on the head of the defenceless customers. The hardships of their situation were exaggerated and increased by their own impatience and anxiety, and the apprehension of a scarce city gradually produced the appearances of a famine. When the luxurious citizens of Antioch complained of the high price of poultry and fish, Julian publicly declared that a frugal city ought to be satisfied with a regular supply of wine, oil, and bread, but he acknowledged that it was his duty as a sovereign to provide for the subsistence of his people. With this salutary view, the emperor ventured on a very dangerous and doubtful step of fixing, by legal authority, the value of corn. He enacted that, in a time of scarcity, it should be sold at a price which has seldom been known in the most plentiful years, and that his own example might strengthen the laws, he sent into the market 422,000 modi, or measures, which were drawn by his order from the granaries of Hierapolis, of Chalcis, and even of Egypt. The consequences might have been foreseen, and were soon felt. The imperial wet was purchased by the rich merchants, the proprietors of land, 
or of corn, withheld from the city the accustomed supply, and the small quantities that appeared in the market were secretly sold at an advanced and illegal price. Julian still continued to applaud his own policy, treated the complaints of the people as a vain and ungrateful murmur, and convinced Antioch that he had inherited the obstinacy, though not the cruelty, of his brother Gallus. The remonstrances of the municipal senate served only to exasperate his inflexible mind. He was persuaded, perhaps with truth, that the senators of Antioch who possessed lands or were concerned in trade had themselves contributed to the calamities of their country, and he imputed the disrespectful boldness which they assumed to the sense not of public duty but of private interest. The whole body, consisting of two hundred of the most noble and wealthy citizens, were sent under the guard from the palace to the prison, and though they were permitted, before the close of evening, to return to their respective houses, the emperor himself could not obtain the forgiveness which he had so easily granted. The same grievances were still the subject of the same complaints which were industriously circulated by the wit and levity of the Syrian Greeks. During the licentious days of the Saturnalia, the streets of the city resounded with insolent songs, which derided the laws, the religion, the personal conduct, and even the beard of the emperor. The spirit of Antioch was manifested by the connivance of the magistrates, and by the applause of the multitude. The disciple of Socrates was too deeply affected by these popular insults. But the monarch, endowed with a quick sensibility, and possessed of absolute power, refused his passions the gratification of revenge. A tyrant might have proscribed without distinction the lives and fortunes of the citizens of Antioch, and the unwarlike Syrians must have patiently submitted to the lust, the rapaciousness, and the cruelty of the faithful legions of Gaul. A milder sentence might have deprived the capital of the East of its honors and privileges, and the courtiers, perhaps the subjects of Julian, would have applauded an act of justice which asserted the dignity of the supreme magistrate of the Republic. But instead of abusing or exerting the authority of the state to revenge his personal injuries, Julian contented himself with an inoffensive mode of retaliation, which it would be in the power of few princes to employ. He had been insulted by satires and libels. In his turn, he composed, under the title of the Enemy of the Beard, an ironical confession of his own faults, and a severe satire on the licentious and effeminate manners of Antioch. This imperial reply was publicly exposed before the gates of the palace, and the Misopogon still remains a singular monument of the resentment, the wit, the humanity, and the indiscretion of Julian. Though he affected to laugh, he could not forgive. His contempt was expressed, and his revenge might be gratified by the nomination of a governor worthy only of such subjects, and the emperor forever renouncing the ungrateful city, proclaimed his resolution to pass the ensuing winter at Tarsus in Cilicia. Yet Antioch possessed one citizen whose genius and virtues might atone, in the opinion of Julian, for the vice and folly of his country. The sophist Libanius was born in the capital of the East. He publicly professed the arts of rhetoric and declamation at Nike, Nicomedia, Constantinople, Athens, and during the remainder of his life at Antioch. His school was assiduously frequented by the Grecian youth. His disciples, who sometimes exceeded the number of eighty, celebrated their incomparable master, and the jealousy of his rivals, who persecuted him from one city to another, confirmed the favorable opinion which Libanius ostentiously displayed of his superior merit. The preceptors of Julian had exhorted a rash but solemn assurance that he would never attend the lectures of their adversary. The curiosity of the royal youth was checked and inflamed. He secretly procured the writings of this dangerous sophist, and gradually surpassed, in the perfect imitation of his style, the most laborious of his domestic pupils. When Julian ascended the throne, he declared his impatience to embrace and reward the Syrian sophist, who had preserved, in a degenerate age, the Greek purity of taste, of manners, and of religion. The emperor's prepossession was increased and justified by the discreet pride of his favorite. Instead of pressing, with the foremost of the crowd, into the palace of Constantinople, Libanius calmly expected his arrival at Antioch, withdrew from court on the first symptoms of coldness and indifference, required a formal invitation for each visit, and taught his sovereign an important lesson, that he might command the obedience of a subject, 
but that he must deserve the attachment of a friend. The sophists of every age, despising or affecting to despise the accidental distinctions of birth and fortune, reserve their esteem for the superior qualities of the mind with which they themselves are so plentifully endowed. Julian might disdain the acclamations of a venal court, who adored the imperial purple, but he was deeply flattered by the praise, the admonition, the freedom, and the envy of an independent philosopher, who refused his favors, loved his person, celebrated his fame, and protected his memory. The voluminous writings of Libanius still exist. For the most part, they are the vain and idle compositions of an orator who cultivated the science of words, the productions of a recluse student whose mind, regardless of his contemporaries, was incessantly fixed on the Trojan War and the Athenian Commonwealth. Yet the sophist of Antioch sometimes descended from this imaginary elevation. He entertained a various and elaborate correspondence. He praised the virtues of his own times. He boldly arranged the abuse of public and private life, and he eloquently pleaded the cause of Antioch against the just resentment of Julian and Theodosius. It is the common calamity of old age to lose whatever might have rendered it desirable, but Libanius experienced the peculiar misfortune of surviving the religion and the sciences to which he had consecrated his genius. The friend of Julian was an indignant spectator to the triumph of Christianity, and his bigotry, which darkened the prospect of the visible world, did not inspire Libanius with any lively hopes of celestial glory and happiness. End of chapter 24 Part 1. Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland. Of the Deline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland. Chapter 24. The Retreat and Death of Julian. Part 2. The martial impatience of Julian urged him to take the field in the beginning of the spring, and he dismissed with contempt and reproach the Senate of Antioch, who accompanied the emperor beyond the limits of their own territory, to which he was resolved never to return. After a laborious march of two days, he halted at the third at Berea, or Aleppo, where he had the mortification of finding a senate almost entirely Christian, who received with cold and formal demonstrations of respect the eloquent sermon of the apostle of paganism. The son of one of the most illustrious citizens of Berea, who had embraced, either from interest or conscience, the religion of the emperor, was disinherited by his angry parent. The father and the son were invited to the imperial table, Julian, placing himself between them, attempted without success to inculcate the lesson and example of toleration, supported, with affected calmness, the indiscreet zeal of the aged Christian, who seemed to forget the sentiments of nature, and the duty of a subject, and at length, turning towards the afflicted youth, "'Since you have lost a father,' said he, "'for my sake, it is incumbent on me to supply his place.' The emperor was received in a manner much more agreeable to his wishes, at Batne, a small town pleasantly seated in a grove of cypresses, about twenty miles from the city of Hierapolis. The solemn rites of sacrifice were decently prepared by the inhabitants of Batne, who seemed attached to the worship of their tutelar deities, Apollo and Jupiter. But the serious piety of Julian was offended by the tumult of their applause, and he too clearly discerned that the smoke which arose from their altars was the incense of flattery, rather than of devotion. The ancient and magnificent temple, which had sanctified for so many ages the city of Hierapolis, no longer subsisted, and the consecrated wealth, which afforded a liberal maintenance to more than three hundred priests, might hasten its downfall. Yet Julian enjoyed the satisfaction of embracing a philosopher and a friend, whose religious firmness had withstood the pressing and repeated solicitations of Constantius and Gallus, as often as those princes lodged at his house in their passage through Hierapolis. In the hurry of military preparation, and the careless confidence of a familiar correspondence, the seal of Julian appears to have been lively and uniform. He had now undertaken an important and difficult war, and the anxiety of the event rendered him still more attentive to observe and register the most 
trifling presages, from which, according to the rules of divination, any knowledge of futurity could be derived. He informed Libanus of his progress as far as Hierapolis, by an elegant epistle, which displays the faculty of his genius, and his tender friendship for the sophist of Antioch. Hierapolis, situated almost on the banks of the Euphrates, had been appointed for the general rendezvous of the Roman troops, who immediately passed the great river on a bridge of boats, which was previously constructed. If the inclinations of Julian had been similar to those of his predecessor, he might have wasted this active and important season of the year in the circus of Samosata or in the churches of Edessa. But as the warlike emperor, instead of Constantius, had chosen Alexander for his model, he advanced without delay to Carhe, a very ancient city of Mesopotamia, at a distance of fourscore miles from Hierapolis. The temple of the moon attracted the devotion of Julian, but the halt of a few days was principally employed in completing the immense preparations of the Persian war. The secret of the expedition had hitherto remained in his own breast, but as Carhe is the point of separation of the two great roads, he could no longer conceal whether it was his design to attack the dominions of Sapor on the side of the Tigris, or on that of the Euphrates. The emperor detached an army of thirty thousand men under the command of his kinsman Procopius, and of Sebastian, who had been Duke of Egypt. They were ordered to direct their march towards Nisibis, and to secure the frontier from the desultory incursions of the enemy, before they attempted the passage of the Tigris. The subsequent operations were left to the discretion of the generals, but Julian expected that after wasting with fire and sword the fertile districts of Media and Adiabene, they might arrive under the walls of Ctesiphon at the same time that he himself, advancing with equal steps along the banks of the Euphrates, should besiege the capital of the Persian monarchy. The success of this well-concerted plan depended, in a great measure, on the powerful and ready assistance of the king of Armenia, who, without exposing the safety of his own dominions, might detach an army of four thousand horse and twenty thousand foot to the assistance of the Romans. But the feeble Arsacesis Tyrannus, king of Armenia, had degenerated still more shamefully than his father Cosroes from the manly virtues of the great Tiridates, and as the pusillanimous monarch was averse to any enterprise of danger and glory, he could disguise his timid indolence by the more decent excuses of religion and gratitude. He expressed a pious attachment to the memory of Constantius, from whose hands he had received in marriage Olympias, the daughter of the prefect Ablavius, and the alliance of a female, who had been educated as the distant wife of the emperor Constans, exalted the dignity of a barbarian king. Tyrannus professed the Christian religion. He reigned over a nation of Christians, and he was restrained by every principle of conscience and interest from contributing to the victory, which would consummate the ruin of the church. The alienated mind of Tyrannus was exasperated by the indiscretion of Julian, who treated the king of Armenia as his slave, and as the enemy of the gods. The haughty and threatening style of the imperial mandates awakened the secret indignations of a prince, who, in the humiliating state of dependence, was still conscious of his royal descent from the Arsacides, the lords of the east, and the rivals of the Roman power. The military dispositions of Julian were skilfully contrived to deceive the spies and to divert the attention of Sapor. The legions appeared to direct their march towards Nisibis and the Tigris. On a sudden they wheeled to the right, traversed the level and naked plain of Carhe, and reached, on the third day, the banks of the Euphrates where the strong town of Niseporium, or Callinicum, had been founded by the Macedonian kings. From thence the emperor pursued his march, above ninety miles, along the winding stream of the Euphrates, till at last, about one month after his departure from Antioch, he discovered the towers of Circesium, the extreme limit of the Roman dominions. The army of Julian, the most numerous that any of the Caesars had ever led against Persia, consisted of 65,000 effective and well-disciplined soldiers. The veteran bands of cavalry and infantry, of Romans and barbarians, had been selected from the different provinces, and a just preeminence of loyalty and valor was claimed by the hardy Gauls, who guarded the throne and person of their beloved prince. A formidable body of Scythian auxiliaries had been transported from another climate, and almost from another world, invade a distant country, of whose name and situation they were ignorant. 
the love of rapine and war allured to the imperial standard several tribes of saracens or roving arabs whose service julian had commanded while he sternly refused the payment of their customary subsidies the broad channel of the euphrates was crowded by a fleet of eleven hundred ships destined to attend the motions and to satisfy the wants of the roman army the military strength of the fleet was composed of fifty armed galleys and these were accompanied by an equal number of flat-bottomed boats which might occasionally be connected into the form of temporary bridges the rest of the ships partly constructed of timber and partly covered with raw hides were laden with an almost inexhaustible supply of arms and engines of utensils and provisions the vigilant humanity of julian had embarked a very large magazine of vinegar and biscuit for the use of the soldiers but he prohibited the indulgence of wine and rigorously stopped a long string of superfluous camels that attempted to follow the rear of the army. The river Caboras falls into the Euphrates at Circesium, and as soon as the trumpet gave the signal of march, the Romans passed the little stream which separated two mighty and hostile empires. The custom of ancient discipline required a military oration, and Julian embraced every opportunity of displaying his eloquence. He animated the impatient and attentive legions, by the example of the inflexible courage and glorious triumph of their ancestors he excited their resentment by a lively picture of the insolence of the persians and he exhorted them to imitate his firm resolution either to extirpate that perfidious nation or to devote his life in the cause of the republic the eloquence of julian was enforced by a donative of one hundred and thirty pieces of silver to every soldier and the bridge of the caboras was instantly cut away to convince the troops that they must place their hopes of safety in the success of their arms. Yet the prudence of the emperor induced him to secure a remote frontier, perpetually exposed to the inroads of the hostile Arabs. A detachment of four thousand men was left at Circesium, which completed, to the number of ten thousand, the regular garrison of that important fortress. From the moment that the Romans entered the enemy's country, the country of an active and artful enemy, the order of march was disposed in three columns. The strength of the infantry, and consequently of the whole army, was placed in the centre, under the peculiar command of their master-general Victor. On the right, the brave Nevita led a column of several legions along the banks of the Euphrates, and almost always in sight of the fleet. The left flank of the army was protected by the column of cavalry. Hormisdas and Arinteus were appointed generals of the horse, and the singular adventures of Hormisdas are not undeserving of an hour notice. He was a Persian prince of the royal race of the Sassanids, who, in the troubles of the minority of Sapor, had escaped from prison to the hospitable court of the great Constantine. Hormisdas at first excited the compassion, and at length acquired the esteem of his new masters. His valor and fidelity raised him to the military honors of the Roman service, and though a Christian, he might indulge the secret satisfaction of convincing his ungrateful country that an oppressed subject may prove the most dangerous enemy. Such was the disposition of the three principal columns. The front and flanks of the army were covered by Lucinianus, with a flying detachment of fifteen hundred light-armed soldiers, whose active vigilance observed the most distant signs and conveyed the earliest notice of any hostile approach. Dagalaipus and Secundinus, Duke of Osroheni, conducted the troops of the rear guard. The baggage securely proceeded in, in the intervals of the columns, and the ranks, from a motive either of use or ostentation, were formed in such open order that the whole line of march extended almost ten miles. The ordinary post of Julian was at the head of the centre column, but as he preferred the duties of a general to the state of a monarch, he rapidly moved with a small escort of light cavalry, to the front, the rear, the flanks, wherever his presence could animate or protect the march of the Roman army. The country which they traversed from the Caboras to the cultivated lands of Assyria may be considered as a part of the desert of Arabia, a dry and barren waste, which could never be improved by the most powerful arts of human industry. Julian marched over the same ground which had been trod above seven hundred years before by the footsteps of the younger Cyrus, and which is described by one of the companions of his expedition, the sage and the heroic Xenophon. The country was a plain throughout, as even as the sea, and full of wormwood, and if any other kinds of shrubs or reeds grew there, 
They had all an aromatic smell, but no trees could be seen. Bustards and ostriches, antelopes and wild asses, appeared to be the only inhabitants of the desert, and the fatigues of the march were alleviated by the amusement of the chase. The loose sand of the desert was frequently raised by the wind into clouds of dust, and a great number of the soldiers of Julian, with their tents, were suddenly thrown to the ground by the violence of an unexpected hurricane. The sandy plains of Mesopotamia were abandoned to the antelopes and wild asses of the desert, but a variety of populous towns and villages were pleasantly situated on the banks of the Euphrates, and in the islands which are occasionally formed by that river. The city of Anna, or Anato, the actual residence of an Arabian emir, is composed of two long streets, which enclose, within a natural fortification, a small island in the midst, and two fruitful spots on either side of the Euphrates. The warlike inhabitants of Anato showed a disposition to stop the march of the Roman Empire, till they were diverted from such fatal presumption by the mild exhortations of Prince Hormistas, and the approaching terrors of the fleet and army. They implored, and experienced, the clemency of Julian, who transplanted the people to an advantageous settlement near Calchis in Syria, and admitted Puseus, the governor, to an honourable rank in his service and friendship. But the impregnable fortress of Tilutha could scorn the menace of a siege, and the emperor was obliged to content himself with an insulting promise that, when he had subdued the interior provinces of Persia, Tilutha would no longer refuse to grace the triumph of the emperor. The inhabitants of the open towns, unable to resist, and unwilling to yield, fled with precipitation, and their houses, filled with spoil and provisions, were occupied by the soldiers of Julian, who massacred, without remorse and without punishment, some defenceless women. During the march, the Surenas, or Persian general, and Malek Rodosaches, the renowned emir of the tribe of Gassan, incessantly hovered around the army, every straggler was intercepted, every detachment was attacked, and the valiant Hormistas escaped with some difficulty from their hands. But the barbarians were finally repulsed, the country became every day less favourable to the operations of cavalry, and when the Romans arrived at Maceprecta, they perceived the ruins of the wall, which had been constructed by the ancient kings of Assyria, to secure their dominions from the incursions of the Medes. These preliminaries of the expedition of Julian appear to have employed about fifteen days, and we may compute near three hundred miles from the fortress of Circesium to the wall of Maceprecta. The fertile province of Assyria, which stretched beyond the Tigris as far as the mountains of Media, extended about four hundred miles from the ancient walls of Maceprecta to the territory of Basra, where the united streams of the Euphrates and Tigris discharged themselves into the Persian Gulf. The whole country might have claimed the peculiar name of Mesopotamia, as the two rivers, which are never more distant than fifty, approach between Baghdad and Babylon within twenty-five miles of each other. A multitude of artificial canals, dug without much labor in a soft and yielding soil, connected the rivers, and they intersected the plain of Assyria. The uses of these artificial canals were various and important. They served to discharge the superfluous waters from one river into the other, at the season of their respective inundations. Subdividing themselves into smaller and smaller branches, they refreshed the dry lands and supplied the deficiency of rain. They facilitated the intercourse of peace and commerce, and, as the dams could be speedily broken down, they armed the despair of the Assyrians with the means of opposing a sudden deluge to the progress of an invading army. To the soil and climate of Assyria, Nature had denied some of her choicest gifts, the vine, the olive, and the fig tree, but the food which supports the life of a man, and particularly wheat and barley, were produced with inexhaustible fertility, and the husbandman, who committed his seeds to the earth, was frequently rewarded with an increase of two, or even of three hundred. The face of the country was interspersed with groves of innumerable palm trees, and the diligent natives celebrated, either in verse or prose, the three hundred and sixty uses to which the trunk, the branches, the leaves, the juice, and the fruit were skilfully applied. Several manufactures, especially those of leather and linen, employed the industry of a numerous people, and afforded valuable materials for foreign trade, which appears, however, to have been conducted by the hands of strangers. Babylon had been converted into a royal park, 
but near the ruins of the ancient capital new cities had successively arisen and the populousness of the country was displayed in the multitude of towns and villages which were built of bricks dried in the sun and strongly cemented with bitumen the natural and peculiar production of the babylonian soil while the successors of cyrus reigned over asia the province of syria alone maintained during a third part of the year the luxurious plenty of the table and household of the great king four considerable villages were assigned for the subsistence of his indian dogs eight hundred stallions and sixteen thousand mares were constantly kept at the expense of the country for the royal stables and as the daily tribute which was paid to the satrap amounted to one english bushel of silver we may compute the annual revenue of assyria at more than twelve hundred thousand pounds sterling End of chapter 24, part 2. Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland. For part 3 of the Deline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland. Chapter 24. The Retreat and Death of Julian. Part 3. The fields of Assyria were devoted by Julian to the calamities of war, and the philosopher retaliated on a guiltless people the acts of rapine and cruelty which had been committed by their haughty master in the Roman provinces. The trembling Assyrians summoned the rivers to their assistance, and completed, with their own hands, the ruin of their country. The roads were rendered impracticable, a flood of waters was poured into the camp, and, during several days, the troops of Julian were obliged to contend with the most discouraging hardships. But every obstacle was surmounted by the perseverance of the legionaries, who were inured to toil as well as to danger, and who felt themselves animated by the spirit of their leader. The damage was gradually repaired, the waters were restored to their proper channels, whole groves of palm trees were cut down and placed along the broken parts of the road, and the army passed over the broad and deeper canals, on bridges of floating rafts, which were supported by the help of bladders. Two cities of Assyria presumed to resist the arms of Roman Empire, and they both paid the severe penalty of their rashness. At the distance of fifty miles from the royal residence of Tesiphon, Perisabor, or Anbar, held the second rank in the province, a city, large, populous, and well fortified, surrounded with a double wall, almost encompassed by a branch of the Euphrates, and defended by the valour of a numerous garrison. The exhortations of Ohrimistas were repulsed with contempt, and the ears of the Persian prince were wounded by a just reproach, that, unmindful of his royal birth, he conducted an army of strangers against his king and country. The Assyrians maintained their loyalty by a skilful as well as vigorous defence, till the lucky stroke of a battering ram, having opened a large breach by shattering one of the angles of the wall, they hastily retired into the fortifications of the interior citadel. The soldiers of Julian rushed impetuously into the town, and after the full gratification of every military appetite, Perisabor was reduced to ashes, and the engines which assaulted the citadel were planted in the ruins of the smoking houses. The contest was continued by an incessant and mutual discharge of missile weapons, and the superiority which the Romans might derive from the mechanical powers of the balliste and catapulte was counterbalanced by the advantage of the ground on the side of the besieged. But as soon as an heliopolis had been constructed, which could engage on equal terms with the loftiest ramparts, the tremendous aspect of a moving turret that would leave no hope of resistance or mercy, terrified the defenders of the citadel into a humble submission, and the place was surrendered only two days after Julian first appeared under the walls of Perisabor. Two thousand five hundred persons of both sexes, the feeble remnant of a flourishing people, were permitted to retire. The plentiful magazines of corn, of arms, and of splendid furniture were partly distributed among the troops, and partly reserved for the public service. The useless stores were destroyed by fire, or thrown into the stream of the Euphrates, and the fate of Amida was revenged by the total ruin of Perisabor. The city, or rather fortress, of Maugamalcha, which was defended by sixteen large towers, a deep ditch, and two strong and solid walls of brick and bitumen, 
appears to have been constructed at the distance of eleven miles as the safeguard of the capital of Persia. The emperor, apprehensive of leaving such an important fortress in his rear, immediately formed the siege of Mau Gamalcha, and the Roman army was distributed for that purpose into three divisions. Victor, at the head of the cavalry, and a detachment of heavy armed foot, was ordered to clear the country as far as the banks of the Tigris and the suburbs of Ctesiphon. The conduct of the attack was assumed by Julian himself, who seemed to place his whole dependence in the military engines which he erected against the walls, while he secretly contrived a more efficacious method of introducing his troops into the heart of the city. Under the direction of Nevita and Dagalaipus, the trenches were opened at a considerable distance and gradually prolonged as far as the edge of the ditch. The ditch was speedily filled with earth, and by the incessant labor of the troops, a mine was carried under the foundations of the walls, and sustained at sufficient intervals by props of timber. Three chosen cohorts, advancing in single file, silently explored the dark and dangerous passage, till their intrepid leader whispered back the intelligence that he was ready to issue from his confinement into the streets of the hostile city. Julian checked their ardor, that he might ensure their success, and immediately diverted the attention of the garrison by the tumult and clamor of a general assault. The Persians, who, from their walls, contemptuously beheld the progress of an impotent attack, celebrated with songs of triumph the glory of Sapor, and ventured to assure the emperor that he might ascend the starry mansion of Ormuzd before he could hope to take the impregnable city of Maugamalcha. The city was already taken. History has recorded the name of a private soldier, the first who ascended from the mine into a deserted tower. The passage was widened by his companions, who pressed forward with impatient valor. Fifteen hundred enemies were already in the midst of the city. The astonished garrison abandoned the walls, and their only hope of safety. The gates were instantly burst open, and the revenge of the soldier, unless it were suspended by lust or avarice, was satiated by an undistinguishing massacre. The governor, who had yielded on a premise of mercy, was burnt alive a few days afterwards, on a charge of having uttered some disrespectful words against the honor of Prince Hormistas. The fortifications were razed to the ground, and not a vestige was left that the city of Maugamalcha had ever existed. The neighborhood of the capital of Persia was adorned with three stately palaces, laboriously enriched with every production that could gratify the luxury and pride of an eastern monarch. The pleasant situation of the gardens along the banks of the Tigris was improved, according to the Persian taste, by the symmetry of flowers, fountains, and shady walks, and spacious parks were enclosed for the reception of the bears, lions, and wild boars, which were maintained at a considerable expense for the pleasure of the royal chase. The park walls were broken down, the savage game was abandoned to the darts of the soldiers, and the palaces of Sapor were reduced to ashes by the command of the Roman emperor. Julian, on this occasion, showed himself ignorant or careless of the laws of civility, which the prudence and refinement of polished ages have established between hostile princes. Yet these wanton ravages need not excite in our breasts any vehement emotions of pity or resentment. A simple naked statue, finished by the hand of a Grecian artist, is of more genuine value than all these rude and costly monuments of barbaric labor. And, if we are more deeply affected by the ruin of a palace than by the conflagration of a cottage, our humanity must have formed a very erroneous estimate of the miseries of human life. Julian was an object of hatred and terror to the Persian, and the painters of that nation represented the invader of their country under the emblem of a furious lion who vomited from his mouth a consuming fire. To his friends and soldiers the philosophic hero appeared in a more amiable light, and his virtues were never more conspicuously displayed than in the last and most active period of his life. He practiced without effort and almost without merit the habitual qualities of temperance and sobriety. According to the dictates of that artificial wisdom which assumes an absolute dominion of the mind and body, he sternly refused himself the indulgence of the most natural appetites. In the warm climate of Assyria, which solicited a luxurious people to the gratification of every sensual desire, a youthful conqueror preserved his chastity pure and inviolate. Nor was Julian ever tempted 
even by a motive of curiosity, to visit his female captives of exquisite beauty, who, instead of resisting his power, would have disputed with each other the honour of his embraces. With the same firmness that he resisted the allurements of love, he sustained the hardships of war. When the Romans marched through the flat and flooded country, their sovereign on foot, at the head of his legions, shared their fatigues and animated their diligence. In every useful labour, the hand of Julian was prompt and stenuous, and the imperial purple was wet and dirty as the coarse garment of the meanest soldier. The two sieges allowed him some remarkable opportunities of signalising his personal valour, which, in the improved state of the military art, can seldom be exerted by a prudent general. The emperor stood before the citadel of Perisabor, insensible of his extreme danger, and encouraged his troops to burst open the gates of iron, till he was almost overwhelmed under the cloud of missile weapons and huge stones that were directed against his person. As he examined the exterior fortifications of Mao Gamalcha, two persons, devoting themselves for their country, suddenly rushed upon him with drawn scimitars. The emperor dexterously received their blows on his uplifted shield, and, with a steady and well-aimed thrust, led one of his adversaries dead at his feet. The esteem of a prince who possesses the virtues which he approves is the noblest recompense of a deserving subject, and the authority which Julian derived from his personal merit enabled him to revive and enforce the rigour of ancient discipline. He punished with death or ignominy the misbehaviour of three troops of horse, who, in a skirmish with the Surenas, had lost their honour and one of their standards, and he distinguished with obsidional crowns the valour of the foremost soldiers who had ascended into the city of Mao Gamalcha. After the siege of Perisabur, the firmness of the emperor was exercised by the insolent avarice of the army, who loudly complained that their services were rewarded by a trifling donative of one hundred pieces of silver. His just indignation was expressed in the grave and manly language of a Roman, Riches are the objects of your desires, those riches are in the hands of the Persians, and the spoils of this fruitful country are proposed as the prize of your valour and discipline. Believe me, added Julian, the Roman Republic, which formerly possessed such immense treasures, is now reduced to want and wretchedness once our princes have been persuaded by weak and interested ministers to purchase with gold the tranquillity of the barbarians. The revenue is exhausted, the cities are ruined, the provinces are dispeopled. For myself, the only inheritance that I have received from my royal ancestors is a soul incapable of fear, and as long as I am convinced that every real advantage is seated in the mind, I shall not blush to acknowledge an honourable poverty, which in the days of ancient virtue was considered as the glory of Fabricius. That glory and that virtue may be your own, if you will listen to the voice of heaven and your leader, but if you will rashly persist, if you are determined to renew the shameful and mischievous examples of old seditions, proceed. As it becomes an emperor who has filled the first rank among men, I am prepared to die standing, and to despise a precarious life, which every hour may depend on an accidental fever. If I have been found unworthy of the command, there are now among you, I speak it with pride and pleasure, there are many chiefs whose merit and experience are equal to the conduct of the most important war. Such has been the temper of my reign, that I can retire without regret and without apprehension to the obscurity of a private station. The modest resolution of Julian was answered by the unanimous applause and, and cheerful obedience of the Romans, who declared their confidence of victory, while they fought under the banners of their heroic prince. Their courage was kindled by his frequent and familiar assertions for such wishes were the oaths of Julian. So may I reduce the Persians under the yoke. Thus may I restore the strength and splendor of the Republic. The love of fame was the ardent passion of his soul, but it was not before he trampled on the ruins of Mao Gamalcha that he allowed himself to say, We have now provided some materials for the sophist of Antioch. The successful valor of Julian had triumphed over all the obstacles that opposed his march to the gates of Ctesiphon, but the reduction, or even the siege, of the capital of Persia was still at a distance, nor can the military conduct of the emperor be clearly apprehended without the knowledge of the country which was the theatre of his bold and skilful operations. Twenty miles to the south of Baghdad, 
and on the eastern banks of the Tigris, the curiosity of travellers has observed some ruins of the palaces of Ctesiphon, which in the time of Julian was a great and populous city. The name and glory of the adjacent Seleucia were forever extinguished, and the only remaining quarter of that Greek colony had resumed, with the Assyrian language and manners, the primitive appellation of Koche. Koche was situated on the western side of the Tigris, but it was naturally considered as a suburb of Ctesiphon, with which we may suppose it to have been connected by a permanent bridge of boats. The united parts contribute to form the common epithet of Almodain, the cities, which the Orientals have bestowed on the winter residence of the Sassanids, and the whole circumference of the Persian capital was strongly fortified by the waters of the river, by lofty walls, and by impracticable morasses. Near the ruins of Seleucia, the camp of Julian was fixed, and secured, by a ditch and rampart, against the sallies of the numerous and enterprising garrison of Coche. In this fruitful and pleasant country, the Romans were plentifully supplied with water and forage, and several forts, which might have embarrassed the motions of the army, submitted, after some resistance, to the efforts of their valour. The fleet passed from the Euphrates into an artificial derivation of that river, which pours a copious and navigable stream into the Tigris, the small distance below the great city. If they had followed this royal canal, which bore the name of Nahar Malcha, the intermediate situation of Koche would have separated the fleet and army of Julian, and the rash attempt of steering against the current of the Tigris, and forcing their way through the midst of a hostile capital, must have been attended with the total destruction of the Roman navy. The prudence of the emperor foresaw the danger, and provided the remedy. As he had minutely studied the operations of Trajan in the same country, he soon recollected that his warlike predecessor had dug a new and navigable canal, which, leaving Koche on the right hand, conveyed the waters of the Nahar Malcha into the river Tigris, at some distance above the cities. From the information of the peasants, Julian ascertained the vestiges of this ancient work, which were almost obliterated by design or accident. By the indefatigable labour of the soldiers, a broad and deep channel was speedily prepared for the reception of the Euphrates. A strong dike was constructed to interrupt the ordinary current of the Nahar Malcha. A flood of waters rushed impetuously into the new bed, and the Roman fleet, steering their triumphant course into the Tigris, derided the vain and ineffectual barriers which the persons of Ctesiphon had erected to oppose their passage. As it became necessary to transport the Roman army over the Tigris, another labour presented itself, of less toil, but of more danger than the preceding expedition. The stream was broad and rapid, the ascent steep and difficult, and the entrenchments which had been formed on the ridge of the opposite bank were lined with a numerous army of heavy cuirassiers, dexterous archers, and huge elephants, who, according to the extravagant hyperbole of Libanius, could trample with the same ease a field of corn or a legion of Romans. In the presence of such an army, the construction of a bridge was impracticable, and the intrepid prince, who instantly seized the only possible expedient, concealed his design, till the moment of execution, from the knowledge of the barbarians, of his own troops, and even of his generals themselves. Under the specious pretense of examining the state of the magazines, fourscore vessels were gradually unladen, and a select detachment, apparently destined for some secret expedition, was ordered to stand to their arms on the first signal. Julian disguised the silent anxiety of his own mind with smiles of confidence and joy, and amused the hostile nations with the spectacle of military games, which he insultingly celebrated under the walls of Coche. The day was consecrated to pleasure, but, as soon as the hour of supper was passed, the emperor summoned the generals to his tent, and acquainted them that he had fixed the night for the passage of the Tigris. They stood in silent and respectful astonishment, but when the venerable Sallust assumed the privilege of his age and experience, the rest of the chiefs supported with freedom the weight of his prudent remonstrances. Julian contented himself with observing that conquest and safety depended on the attempt that instead of diminishing the number of their enemies would be increased by successive reinforcements, and that a longer delay would neither contract the breadth of the stream nor level the heights of the bank. The signal was instantly given, and obeyed. The most impatient of the legionaries leaped into five vessels that lay nearest to the bank, 
and as they plied their oars with intrepid diligence, they were lost after a few moments in the darkness of the night. A flame arose on the opposite side, and Julian, who too clearly understood that his foremost vessels, in attempting to land, had been fired by the enemy, dexterously converted their extreme danger into a presage of victory. "'Our fellow soldiers!' he eagerly exclaimed. "'Are already masters of the bank. See, they make the appointed signal. Let us hasten to emulate and assist their courage.' The united and rapid motion of a great fleet broke the violence of the current, and they reached the eastern shore of the Tigris with sufficient speed to extinguish the flames and rescue their adventurous companions. The difficulties of a steep and lofty ascent were increased by the weight of armor and the darkness of the night. A shower of stones, darts, and fire was incessantly discharged on the heads of the assailants, who, after an arduous struggle, climbed the bank and stood victorious upon the rampart. As soon as they possessed a more equal field, Julian, who with his light infantry had led the attack, darted through the ranks a skilful and experienced eye. His bravest soldiers, according to the precepts of Homer, were distributed in the front and rear, and all the trumpets of the imperial army sounded to battle. The Romans, after sending up a military shout, advanced in measured steps to the animating notes of martial music launched their formidable javelins, and rushed forwards with drawn swords to deprive the barbarians, by a closer onset, of the advantage of their missile weapons. The whole engagement lasted above twelve hours, till the gradual retreat of the Persians was changed into a disorderly flight, of which the shameful example was given by the principal leader, and the Serenas himself. They were pursued to the gates of Ctesiphon, and the conquerors might have entered the dismayed city if their general Victor, who was dangerously wounded with an arrow, had not conjured them to desist from a rash attempt, which must be fatal, if it were not successful. On their side, the Romans acknowledged the loss of only seventy-five men, while they affirmed that the barbarians had left on the field of battle two thousand five hundred or even six thousand of their bravest soldiers. The spoil was such as might be expected from the riches and luxury of an oriental camp, large qualities of silver and gold, splendid arms and trappings, and beds and tables of massy silver. The victorious emperor distributed, as the rewards of valor, some honorable gifts, civic and mural, and naval crowns, which he, and perhaps he alone, esteemed more precious than the wealth of Asia. A solemn sacrifice was offered to the god of war, but the appearances of the victims threatened the most inauspicious events, and Julian soon discovered, by less ambiguous signs, that he had now reached the term of his prosperity. On the second day after the battle, the domestic guards, the Jovans and Herculeans, and the remaining troops, which composed near two-thirds of the whole army, were securely wafted over the Tigris, while the Persians beheld from the walls of Ctesiphon the desolation of the adjacent country. Julian cast many an anxious look towards the north, in full expectation that as he himself had victoriously penetrated to the capital of Sapur, the march and junction of his lieutenants, Sebastian and Procopius, would be executed with the same courage and diligence. His expectations were disappointed by the treachery of the Armenian king, who permitted, and most probably directed, the desertion of his auxiliary troops from the camp of the Romans, and by the dissensions of the two generals, who were incapable of forming or executing any plan for the public service. When the emperor had relinquished the hope of this important reinforcement, he condescended to hold a council of war, and approved, after a full debate, the sentiments of those generals who dissuaded the siege of Ctesiphon as a fruitless and pernicious undertaking. It is not easy for us to conceive by what arts of fortification a city, thrice besieged and taken by the predecessors of Julian, could be rendered impregnable against an army of sixty thousand Romans, commanded by a brave and experienced general, and abundantly supplied with ships, provisions, battering engines, and military stores. But we may rest assured that the love of glory and contempt of danger, which formed the character of Julian, that he was not discouraged by any trivial or imaginary obstacles. At the very time when he declined the siege of Ctesiphon, he rejected with obstinacy and disdain the most flattering offers of a negotiation of peace. Sapor, who had been so long accustomed to the tardy ostentations of Constantius, was surprised by the intrepid diligence of his successor. As far as the confines of India and Scythia, 
the satraps of the distant provinces were ordered to assemble their troops, and to march without delay to the assistance of their monarch. But their preparations were dilatory, their motions slow, and before Sapor could lead an army into the field, he received the melancholy intelligence of the devastation of Assyria, the ruin of his palaces, and the slaughter of his bravest troops, who defended the passage of the Tigris. The pride of royalty was humbled in the dust, he took his repast on the ground, and the disorder of his hair expressed the grief and anxiety of his mind. Perhaps he would not have refused to purchase, with one half of his kingdom, the safety of the remainder, and he would have gladly subscribed himself, in a treaty of peace, the faithful and dependent ally of the Roman conqueror. Under the pretense of private business, a minister of rank and confidence was secretly dispatched to embrace the niece of Horemisdas, and to request, in the language of a suppliant, he might be introduced into the presence of the emperor. The Sassanian prince, whether he listened to the voice of pride or humanity, whether he consulted the sentiments of his birth or the duties of his situation, was equally inclined to promote a salutary measure, which would terminate the calamities of Persia and secure the triumph of Rome. He was astonished by the inflexible firmness of a hero, who remembered, most unfortunately for himself and for his country, that Alexander had uniformly rejected the propositions of Darius. But as Julian was sensible, that the hope of a safe and honorable peace might cool the ardor of his troops, he earnestly requested that Hormisdas would privately dismiss the meeting of Sapor, and conceal this dangerous temptation from the knowledge of the camp. End of chapter 24, part 3 Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland